All right, welcome back to another episode of the Two Wheeled Rider Podcast presented by JT Motorsports. I am your host, Mario Orsini, joined by Brian Boyer. All right, Brian, we've had a lot going on here lately. Um, we're, we're not going to recap all of it because we're probably going to dedicate an entire podcast to it here at some point um, once all of these things happen. But going back, uh, we're going back a few weeks ago, we had the charity event. Uh, I know you posted a lot of stuff on that. Uh, for those not familiar with the charity event, uh, essentially it's an, we'll call it annual. It didn't happen last year for obvious reasons, but it's an annual charity ride uh, sponsored by the r and uh, Dirt Bike Club, Motorcycle Club, whatever you want to call them, out at your family's farm. This year we raised money for pediatric, I know it was pediatric Bra- cancer, but it was, was a specific Pediatric time. brain a pediatric brain t- brain tumor foundation in partnership with the ride for kids. What was the, so just so everybody knows, like there's an entry fee, there's a ride fee, camp fee, you know, those sorts of things. It's really affordable. It's a lot of fun. Uh, what was the rider? Si- so rider total is those is the amount of riders that actually signed up to ride on the trails. And so what was the rider total this year? Uh, just, we were what six or seven uh, behind three hundred, which is definitely an all time high, and even more important, an all time high by a lot on the amount we were able to donate, which was sixteen thousand dollars. Yeah, it was huge. It was also a really fun weekend. So, well, uh, we got we got blessed with by amazing weather. I know the guest that's coming on tonight was also out there supporting it. So it was just cool to catch up with a lot of uh, people that I haven't got to. Um, you know, I think it's cool in the trail ride you know, atmosphere that it allows for that kind of, you know, catching up with your fellow rider versus out there just, you know, hammering laps. Yeah, it was, it was kind of interesting. You and I had, uh, I think you did first. And then once I arrived, I got out there Saturday morning. We actually had some people come up and talk to us. We never met before that watch, uh, we'll say our YouTube channels. I think they well, I got to thank you a lot. And I know you're a little more used to it, but I think it was the first event I was at where people came up and said, Hey, I watched your video. And I'm just like, well, usually that's only my friends and I can't even get my wife to watch them. So it was, uh, it was humbling, but, but great to catch up with everyone. And, and also to our podcast listeners that came up and, and talked about some of the podcasts that we've done. That was really cool. Yeah. And if you guys see us, you know, whether any, uh, I'll just, I mean, granted, if you just see me in general public, that's too, uh, that's cool too. come up and say hi. But if you see us at, you know, some sort of motorcycle related event, come up and say hi. Cause we normally get bags of stickers, you know, in our pickups or on the bike or whatever. So it was cool to hand some of those out. Uh, Rusty, <laughs> he stopped down at the Slainsville general store. He got recognized by two people sitting there. Uh, well, I'll say he got recognized. He did. Uh, but one of the people recognized his bikes, uh, or one of, you know, his bike first because they've, they've seen that pop up on the, uh, on the YouTube channel a few times. So I don't know what Rusty's charging for autographs these days or, or if he's just popping selfies or whatever, but I think he, he got a kick out of that. Um, something else we just completed. Was it was last, was last weekend or weekend before when we went on the wild and wonderful trip? I don't even know. Yeah, it's time's flying by. I guess it was. I guess it was last weekend. I mean, it, it was a uh, another great weekend, blessed by some some great weather. We've been getting lucky with these events. Yeah, we got caught in a little bit. It was a three day event. We got caught in a little bit of rain on Friday and Saturday, but nothing nothing major. I mean, just a little bit. And uh, Sunday was perfect all day, so it was cool to uh, to meet meet some folks on that and uh, and have a good time riding. Um, I haven't watched, I know you just put out your first video today. I've watched like the first minute or so of it, but I've been busy working on stuff all day. I'll have to catch up on that. But, uh, <laughs> this is the first time on one of those events, somebody went to the emergency room with nothing to do with the, the yeah, bike, it, had, right? it had nothing to do with riding. It was just kidney stone. So you can't, you can't blame me for that. But, uh, you know, that was fun. I'm, um, you know, we're recording this on a Thursday night. It's almost nine o'clock. I'm leaving for Austin tomorrow to go down and watch MotoGP for the weekend. Uh, Danielle and I are going down. Tyler's uh, flying down on the same flight as us. We're we're all staying at the same place and uh, looking forward to uh, to watching some MotoGP. You know, in in theory, uh, Rossi's last uh, race in the United States, at least at the uh, GP level. So. 
that'll be good. I know there's a lot of folks I know that are going to be down there either from the area or that I know through, you know, YouTube or the podcast or whatever. So uh, hopefully I get to meet up with as many people as possible. I don't know what the ticket sales look like right now. I did hear, obviously it's happened down at uh, Circuit of the Americas. I did hear that Formula One sold out the uh, U.S. Grand Prix 360,000 tickets. Wow. I mean, that's great to hear, especially with all the the craziness after after COVID and be able to have a great event with, with that many tickets and people getting out and enjoying what they love. Dude, I tried to watch that Netflix series, the, the Formula One, like behind the scenes thing, whatever they call it. Because I've never been a big Formula One fan. There's not enough passing. Eh, I don't know. It's just, and I thought, man, if I watch this series, like, this is going to be awesome. And you know what I took away from the first three, four episodes I've watched? If MotoGP does this, it will be 10 times more popular than Formula One because even watching that series, I'm bored to death watching the Formula One series, which is the highlights and the behind the scenes. If you show me the highlights and behind the scenes of MotoGP or show that to a normal human being that just wants to watch something on Netflix, they're going to be floored of what actually happens in that series. Oh, absolutely. And then... uh you know, in the meantime, uh, I don't I don't even know how many pieces my 990's in right now. I'm doing a bunch of upgrades to that because we got the uh, we got the two WR ADV again <laughs> ADV event coming up next weekend. Uh, how many? I forget how many total riders we have. 14, 15, something 14. like that. That thing yeah, sold out really quickly. Uh, I'm pretty pleased with the group of people coming along because about half of them have been on uh, you know a wild and wonderful weekend event before. So. We've got a great uh, great route laid out. I guess at this point, you've probably ridden, what, three-quarters of the entire route? Yeah, I'd, I'd say about that. I know we had to cut off foot there, and you were talking through the rest of the way. But, yeah, I, I, can't, I can't wait, one, to ride it again, and then two, to ride it with people. So uh, I'm excited. I think we got a, one hell of a loop. So on the Wild Wonderful, we had one Harley-Davidson Pan America. On this event, we have two Harley Davidson Pan Americas. So we'll we'll get to see what it looks like, you know, on the road and probably what it looks like laying on its side off road. Nothing well, against I still, the bike. I it's just, just want to picture with Mario on there. Stuff. Nah, it, it's going to be fun. Uh, I'm I'm pretty excited, you know, the, gr- the group of guys we've got coming along. While half of them have been on, a, you know, some sort of uh, riding event through our, you know, through the YouTube channel before, I do know some of the other guys that are coming along too, so it's uh, I'm really looking forward to that. Speaking of uh, of uh, people we know and maybe some we don't know, uh, let's get into uh, thanking some people so we can get over to our guest tonight. So if you guys aren't familiar with what these different levels are, uh, you can head over to twrpodcast.com and uh, check it out. But at the contributor level, we have Luke Harding, we have Dylan, we have Alexander Marsh, we have Bean and Leaf LLC. And new to the contributor level, at least for this episode, the first one we recorded since he's joined, we have Green Traveling Machine. Uh, that is his uh, handle on Instagram. His actual name is Brendan. And that's someone my sister and I got to meet up with uh, on the cross-country trip this year out in... I wish she had her journal here with me right now, but I'm pretty sure it was Silverton, Colorado is where we got to meet up with him. So uh, I think he's going to try to get to uh, one of the events uh, through the YouTube channel next year. So it'd be cool to actually ride with him. So um, moving on to the production crew level, we have Amanda Nat from She Shall Ride. I saw it looked like from her Instagram post or Facebook post, whatever I saw, it was the first time she'd ever been to Barber Motorsports Museum. I don't know why it took her so long to get down there because that might be the coolest place on earth. Yeah, great pictures. I thought it looked like they had a great vacation. And and the neat thing about that place is um, if you go down again like a month from now, okay, a lot of the bikes and stuff sitting in there are going to be the same, but that's one of those things they're constantly rotating in and out the the, uh, display motorcycles because – They've got more than they can actually, you know, put on the showroom, uh, not showroom floor, but put on the floor. So, uh, also at the production crew level, we have Morgan Graves. We've got uh, Travis Herman. We've got Marshall 3498, YouTube handle, uh, Joe Stomack, Daniel Shepard, and Mike Clayton. Mike Clayton's been on a wild and wonderful, and now Mike Clayton is coming on the 2WR ADV with his KTM 1290 Super Adventure. Uh, we're going to have some fun with uh, Mike next weekend. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. 
Yeah, definitely. We owe him a drink after some of those whiskey sponsors and looking forward to catching up with him again. He's been on the podcast a couple of times. Yeah, for sure. Uh, executive producer level, we got uh, Jordan Roberts, uh, Dad Mode on YouTube. He was supposed to come on the ADV event, but uh, he's getting an all new engine for his uh, 790 rally. So he's, he's not going to be able to make it. Uh, parts aren't going to be in in time. Uh, two other guys that have been on Wild Wonderful Weekend before that are coming along, uh, Jeff and Joe uh, Minocchio. Looking forward to uh, riding with those guys. Last time we saw them, they were on well, – I remember Joe was on that 390. I, I'm trying to remember what Jeff was on. Yeah, I just remember the 390 hammering down yeah. those, those twisties. He was yeah. doing awesome for that. Yeah, that for sure. I, I know those guys, you know, Joe's on a um, – uh, Super Tenere and uh, Jeff's on an Africa Twin now. Uh, we got Alan Bound at the executive producer level. We got Paul Benton. We got Jeff Nolan. He's coming along on the uh, 2WR ADV event on his uh, Triumph Scrambler. So it'd be cool to, they, those are just cool looking bikes. So that would be awesome to, uh, and thank God he put a new tire on the back of that thing. He, he, <laughs> he was down to baloney skins at that point. So. Uh, we got uh, Brian Flickinger. We've got Neil Pence. Uh, we got to ride with Neil Pence uh, weekend last weekend, weekend before. I don't know. I've lost track of time at this point. But uh, on the Wild Wonderful Weekend event, him and his brother came along. Uh, Neil was on one of the new Pan Americas. His was the uh, the orange color one. That is the only one. That's the only color I've seen in the wild so far. So um, I think he burnt through his pants at one point. Yeah, it's a, we're going to have to do something about that. that. That header pipe was getting a little hot on her. But uh, pretty neat looking bike seeing it in person. I'll, I'll, also, if I was nicer uh, talking about that bike, I think Neil was going to loan it out to me for a review on my YouTube channel, but I, I may have burnt that bridge. Uh, we got uh, Travis Miller. I, I think Travis DM'd me earlier. I think he's going to be down at Austin, so hopefully meet up with him. We've got uh, Nicholas Browse. I don't remember how I pronounced it last time, but it wasn't correct. And he DM'd me, and he was like, dude, it's pronounced like house. So I'll get it right from here on out. We've got uh, Jeff Hokinson. We've got John Demick. He actually uh, texted me earlier today. It was good to hear from him. We've got Jeff Shingler. He's coming along on the 2WR ADV event. Don't quote me on this, but I'm pretty sure he's on an 1190R. He's on an 1190. I'm pretty sure it's the R model. And then... uh. Also new, uh, we've got uh, Todd Armsworth. He's uh, he's sort of local. He's kind of in between you and I, Brian. And then we're going to give uh, Neil Pence a quick shout-out because when he arrived at the house uh, for the Wild and Wonderful, he brought a long, and we're not drinking it tonight. Honestly, I'm just sitting here drinking light beer because I'm taking a little easy tonight. But he did bring along some whiskey for the podcast. It's a Calumet Farm Single Rack Black 12-year. So uh, we'll, we'll crack that open at some point. So anyway, guys, we are going to uh, head to a quick commercial break. And when we come back, we'll be joined by tonight's guest. When Brian and I need something for our bikes, we head to JT Motorsports in Frederick, Maryland. It's not just parts we buy. We also buy motorcycles. Recently, I picked up a 2020 KTM 1290 Super Adventure R. Yeah, I wonder where you got that idea. But it is true. We don't just buy motorcycle parts. We also do buy motorcycles from JTs, and that's why I picked up a 2020 Husqvarna FE 350. That's right. I bought something that's not a KTM, but it is made off the same assembly line. JTs recently moved into a brand new, huge facility, conveniently located just minutes off of I-270 and I-70. Their massive showroom floor holds brand new models from Polaris, Can-Am, Kawasaki, Suzuki, Husqvarna, KTM, and now specialized e-bikes. If you haven't tried an e-bike, you have to. Those things are so much fun to ride. And for the wee little riders, check out their line of Stasic Kids bikes, which are the perfect way to get youngsters involved in riding. Their showroom floor also features a huge selection of riding gear, accessories, and other essentials to keep your machines running good and looking good. They carry some of the top brands in riding gear, including Arai and Climb. Need parts for your bike? They keep a ton of parts in stock and ship daily. Heck, you even have the option to call, email, or text your parts orders in. If you don't like working on your own bike, that's okay, because they have a full service department that will work on any maker model. Just mention the Two Wheeled Rider podcast when you call, email, text, or stop in the shop, and you'll immediately get a 10% discount on parts and accessories. Visit jtmotorsports.net or call 301-846-4318. 
And if you didn't write that down, don't worry. You can find it in the podcast show notes or YouTube video description along with their address. All right, let's get back to the show. All right, so once again, thank you, JT Motorsports, for continuing to sponsor the podcast. We are ready for our guest tonight. He is an accomplished off-road dirt bike rider from West by God, Virginia. He put his racing on hold for a little while, though, to join the National Guard. He is also an engineering graduate from WVU. I have a piece of paper on the wall from WVU, too, but go herd. Upon graduating, uh, he got back into the dirt bike scene. He's been tackling a variety of events to include GNCC, National Enduros, and even the Red Bull Tennessee Knockout. Brian mentioned earlier we did get to speak with him while we were out at the charity event, and when I asked him what he was up to, he responded with the following. And I live in a van down by the river. (laughs) It's kind of true. But in all seriousness, he has been traveling around the country in a van, riding his dirt bike, and that's one one of the major reasons we wanted to bring him on tonight. So please welcome to the podcast, Corey Schaefer. Corey, welcome to the podcast. Hey guys, I appreciate you having me on. I told you I was going to have that sound clip when I had you on. <laughs> yeah, you know, I actually have, uh, I've ordered a bobblehead, a Matt Foley bobblehead. Uh, it's on back order, but when it arrives, it's going to be the bobblehead riding in the front of the van. It's got to be. So, you know, this isn't one of the questions that we had on there, but, um, and, and I, I, it's actually not a question at all, but I'm just curious and we we'll, we're going to backtrack here in a second because but because it's kind of top of mind obviously traveling around traveling around by a van has become popular but it's also become basically like a mainstream media story right now given the uh, Gabby Patino case what i found interesting obviously like most of the country I, I, you know i was paying attention to it but, but i told Brian i was like i had to go back and rewatch my cross country footage because I realized they were in Moab the same time I was in Moab. And I even, so I, dude, like I haven't edited a damn, well, I don't know. I've edited like one day of footage so far and I made it to Kentucky. But I I start looking at, you know, the uh, police report and everything else. And I'm like, holy crap, they're there the same time. I, I missed them at the entrance of Arches National Park on the same day by two hours. So I had to go back through and watch all my footage. Unfortunately, there's no white Ford transit van with a ladder on the back of it. So my YouTube channel is just going to steadily grow at like 10 subscribers a day. There's not going to be that 10,000 K boost, but anyway, just, uh, you, you were, you were already back by then, right? I, I was back by then. That's but, a good know, alibi to have. roads in and out of Moab. And, you know, chances are you probably passed them. Yeah, I, I obviously I'm not recording at all times. Like I pulled up drone footage, which not that I would fly my drone in the national park, but no, you know, never. I, I, <laughs> I pulled up all that stuff and I'm like, damn it, don't have it. So anyway, uh, Corey, we do want to start out tonight's podcast like we do all of them for the uh, you know for guests that have been on for the first time. Uh, obviously, it's the Two Wheeled Rider podcast, so we are going to talk motorcycles. So tell us a little bit how you uh, got started into riding motorcycles. Yeah, actually, uh, I got started through my dad. I feel like that's a story for a lot of people. Uh, my dad, you know, he grew up in West by God, Virginia, as well, uh, West Virginia, and he, uh, he started riding motorcycles when he was 13. He never stopped he got me into it, got my sister into it. And, you know, at a young age, we were a family that was spending every weekend driving down the East coast, to go to a motorcycle race in our 1970s camper. And, uh, you know, that, that, that got me hooked. Um, uh, it, it got me hooked on a lot of things from just constantly being on the road, I, loving to travel and, being outside on the weekends. That's how I, I spend my weekends now. Whenever I have a choice, I'm outside and or I'm on the road. So when you were growing up, what what uh were you guys chasing points in big series or were you going around to to locals? What what was it that uh you guys spent your time, you know, going to? So the Virginia Championship Hair Scramble series, um, which I'm sure there are a couple of guys who follow that series that listen to you. Um, you know, we, we followed that. We had a few GNCCs and when I got back into the sport, 
a big thing for me was I'd always wanted, as a kid, wanted to go pursue the GNCCs, the National Enduro, you know, the big races. And my dad would say no, uh, you know, because he, you know, he drove a lot for his work and he didn't want to hit the road again come the weekend. So, you know, between that and, and money, he, he had very good reasons not to go. So uh, once I became my own man and I could do it myself, you know, I've just been hitting the nationals. Yeah. And, and so Corey and I, a funny story. So obviously we're bringing on Corey and, and Corey and I actually met um, at a race. Um, I still remember it. He was on his uh, Suzuki 125, way younger than me. I got back into it in my 20s and was just starting out. So I think it was my second hair scramble um, since I was like seven or eight and uh was there and i think he lost this camelback nipple on the the top or there's something <laughs> that i needed to help hold his bike and and i held his bike and then uh, that was the last time i saw the bike he uh he waxed me pretty good and, and i i looked up to that young kid and uh it got me uh trying harder and 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 getting back into it and i know he kind of did something similar and had to take a break and then uh get back into it but maybe talk a, a little bit about those series um you know, after your, your younger years in the VCHSS, I, I know we met at a uh, AMA district seven and at rocket raceway, I think is the first time I met you. Yeah, it was rocket raceway, um, district seven. So I followed that for two or three years back when it was district seven. Of course, now it's, it's by and large been replaced by the SXCS series and, uh, the district seven, I enjoyed that just because you got to ride such a diverse, uh, you know, set of terrain, and it was different than the Virginia series, where the Virginia series you have either your eastern round or your round out of the mountains. Um, the District Seven, we piggybacked off of a lot of different series, like District Five, um, whatever the uh, I think the PA State Hair Scramble series, ECEA, and so it was always something different, and I enjoyed it, and. I think what I actually enjoy more about the local races than I do with, say, the GNCCs is when I meet people, they live within driving distance of me. You know, like when I met you, um, you were 45 minutes from where I live. And, you know, when you go to the GNCCs or these nationals, I meet people and they're like, oh, I live in southern Illinois. I'm like, well, that's cool. Uh, I guess I'll see you at <laughs> the next weekend. You know, you, you don't you don't make riding buddies that way. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, it's kind of funny, too, when you go to our races, the races may be four or five hours, six hours from home, and I meet people that live s s way closer to me that I never would have had a clue that I, they actually ride, but the fact that I meet them so far away, um, but yet there's more people around your area that ride than you know, it's just harder to find them because <laughs> they're riding. <laughs> right. You know, I, I meet a lot of guys, and... um we exchange numbers and, you know, I talk to them a good bit, but and we all, we're always planning that riding trip that never happens. And it's just because you live so far away and everybody has their own life that they're pursuing. Not everybody can live in a van down by the river. <laughs> you know, they, they don't have that, that freedom. Um, and that's fine, but that's what makes it nice when you, you are part of a local community. So, Corey, I mean, I don't want to say the main reason, but I mean, it'll it'll probably be in the title. But w one of the main reasons we brought you on, we've talked about dirt bike riding and racing and those sorts of things. But kind of what makes you unique from you know a lot of dirt bike riders and racers. I mean, obviously, I, you know, I follow a couple of Instagram accounts, YouTube channels, whatever that do van conversions, but they're usually like quote unquote moto vans. You know, they're kind of set up for the weekend and. um you know, they're set up, throw your bike in there. You got a spot to sleep for a day or two, and, you know, and then you come back home. And yeah, yeah, I guess if you're a pro, you work on your bike, and if you're not, you go to work during the week, and, you, you know, then you go racing again on the weekends. But, um, you know, I know a lot of our listeners, because I think it's a, a lot of us in the back of our head are like, if we could get a van or a truck with a nice trailer or maybe an RV, maybe an RV. like whatever it is. Um, we would do it. So, you know, you converted a van into a living quarters and you traveled around the country. What gave you that idea to begin with? Yeah. So that's an excellent question. Um, I'm going to start off by saying when I went to start to build that van for what I was trying to set it up to do my unique case, uh, I couldn't find any references online. 
Um, and that proved to be a huge hurdle in terms of trying to maximize and design that, that small space. But to answer your question, I think what gave me that idea is when I joined the, the Air National Guard, I was a plane mechanic on C-130s. And a C-130 can be outfitted in a num- numerous different ways to suit whatever mission that it is that we're flying. And a cool part about my job as a mechanic on that particular airframe when it would fly around, you know, the area of responsibility, when it would fly around Iraq and in Syria and stuff like that, they would send a mechanic along with the plane in case it broke. And the main reason why was when it would land, if it broke, I could start fixing it or I would, I could pinpoint the problem to get the parts to arrive faster, to get the manpower required to fix it faster and ultimately get the plane off the ground. And it wasn't a hotel on wheels, but we had a bathroom. We had a microwave, a little kitchenette, and it was plenty comfy to live in for a couple of days if we were flying and hopping around for several days. And that was kind of my inspiration for the van. Um, I, of course, I've always I've loved to travel. I've, I've always wanted or I pictured a life for myself after college of being able to just travel and adventure and get paid for it. It wasn't necessarily thinking about a van. Um, but when I got the opportunity to move to a remote status with my work, I immediately said, Oh, I have to go get a van. So a month later I got a van and two months later I had the van built and I was hitting the road. Yeah. So you talk about, you know, I feel like for a lot of people, you know, the whole COVID thing went one way or another and feel for the people that had a difficult situation. But a lot of people, I think, found a new lease on life or, or realize there's more outside of that, that nine to five or for a lot of us way more than nine to five job. And I think it's pretty cool. You took advantage of that at the maximum level and, and built that van and, and really chased your dreams. So, so what was kind of that, that switch of going, okay, I'm going to do this. And how long did it take you to, cause I imagine it's, you didn't just go out and buy a van. You talked about converting it. So from the time that you got that remote status to being able to build the van. Talk a little bit about that process of the build and how long it took. And, and Corey, one other quick thing, just because I think listeners are going to want to know, you know, what what was the make and model that, that you chose to go with? All right, so the make and model, uh, 2018 Ford Transit, and I got the high roof, fully extended version. So as big as you can get it, uh, I got it used. Um, there was only seven in the country. And uh, this one had 15,000 miles on it. And I purchased it, you know, just up the road from where I was living at the time. The uh, the fun fact, I think all listeners should know if they don't already, with these commercial vehicles, if you're buying it not as a business entity, your credit approval your will be considered riskier for most banks. So even though I had a, a fair credit score, you know, I had a just shy of a 700 at the time. I uh, was only approved by two banks and at a much higher interest rate than I was with my brand new truck that I drove in to, to trade. And uh, so just, you know, throwing that out there is you might think, oh, it's the same value as my truck, or it's cheaper than my truck, but the bank doesn't see it that way. And uh, that, that compounding interest, it's a real bitch. <laughs> uh, but to answer your question in terms of building, the hardest part of this whole part was building to getting a remote job. Um, COVID helped because it forced a lot of people to work remote and employers were able to see that it works. And, you know, you could, people were happier. So that helped with asking. But for me, I got into engineering and I was working in aviation where I, was having to go to an air base every day. You know, you had to be there for a variety of different reasons. But the majority of my opportunities for moving up the ranks there were software-based. And I had some software skills, but that's not what I went to school for. So I went to the library, you know, or to Barnes & Noble and picked up some books on coding and continued to just improve that until I built my resume to a strong enough point that I could apply and stand a legitimate chance of, you know, 
uh, being accepted at a software development company, which is where I work now. And I started there with the plan of asking for a remote position in time. Then COVID happened and I went to my, my boss and I said, Hey, you know, this remote work thing's been working out pretty good. You don't see me having to come to the office, right? And he's like, no, no, at least not for another year. I was like, well, can I get that in writing? He's why? Well, I want to buy a van. <laughs> I want to travel. And fun fact, my, I got lucky. Um, here, my boss, before he was an engineer, he played in a band, in a, in a van, sorry, in a band. <laughs> and he traveled around the country living in that van, you know, just slapping the bass um, and living the life before he decided to actually, you know, get some responsibilities and cut his hair. So he was all for it. And he wanted me to show pictures the whole time, you know, and it just made the whole experience. Um, I was blessed. Yeah, but I like how you were, you're up front and honest about that and making sure that it was possible because there could be nothing worse than buying the van and then your job's like, oh, just kidding. <laughs> Got to come back into the office. So it's good that you approach that. So any idea on, um, you know, I love being kind of open because uh, to be honest with you, you know, I look up this all the time. Like I love the conversions from the moto thing more from the weekend thing. If I didn't have so many damn kids, the van is the, is the way to go for the weekend stuff. This is a little bit a van on steroids cause you're living out of it. But any idea kind of on the ballpark figure on that conversion, because I think you have a unique story where you did a lot of work yourself. Um, so I think a lot of listeners are kind of curious, what's the cost to kind of do that? Well, there's two different ways to approach that. If you want to mimic what you see on Instagram, you're looking at, you know, probably at minimum 20K on top of the van that you just, you know, signed a loan for. If you do it the way I did it, which is very utilitarian, I spent just shy of two grand and I didn't finish building it out all the way before I left. I actually stockpiled the remaining bit of like the wood and materials that I had. And it's currently sitting in a shed right now and I'm getting ready to start building. We'll call it, um, you know, van 2.0 to finish the rest of my ideas and finish it out. So it it takes a lot of work. Um, It seems everybody on Instagram is a master carpenter. You know, they, even though they're like, oh, I'm a, I'm a web graphic designer, but look at this amazing, you know, bar and cabinet that I built. It's professional quality. I feel like they have a lot of uncles or grandpas who are really good with working with wood and raw material. Um, I don't feel like they're always truthful. There's always that case, though. There's always that exemption. So, you know, there's people out there listening right now like, hey, wait a second. I learned how to do this all on my own. Well, you know, I tip my hat to you because it's hard. It's hard when you're working a full-time job. It's hard when you're building this van in the mid-Atlantic during the wintertime. And it's below 30 degrees. And the adhesive that you're using doesn't want to cure properly. But you need it to care because you're trying to you you've already told your landlord that you're moving out. And in one month, you got to have a home built <laughs> and on the road. Yeah, that's what I like about what you talk about. It, it It's to me and it's what we always talk about. A lot of our listen, listeners we're, we're we're all for the every man, the every woman. And I think the stuff you see online, you're like, oh, look at that. I could live in that. Yeah, of course, because you're spending, like you said, $20,000 after you purchase the van. But it sounds like you really took the right approach. Rather than delaying get at, getting out there and enjoying the experiences, you build it just enough to get you out there, and then it's almost a stepping stone approach of, okay, I'll build more as I go, but I don't want to miss out on those experiences. Right. And, you know, I, I basically I built the floor, and because the floor is a, a vital part for everything else because the vans, they're curved. And unless you want to start drilling holes in the side of your van, which I didn't want to do in case everything fell through and I needed to sell this. Um, 
you needed the floor as a, a key piece to put everything else together. So I started the floor, I built a bed, a desk, and I made sure I had a place for my bike and one shelf. Well, uh, the, no heat. The and, bike's the most important thing. You got to fit the oh, bike. Oh, absolutely. In. Yeah. So that was with the van build itself. For me, I wanted to have my van inside my my bike inside the van. And the reason why is because here, especially around the DC area, bike theft is a huge problem. Uh, Brian, you've lived this. Brian had like 37 bikes stolen at one point, and then he publicly <laughs> shamed at least 35 of those people and got them all back. There was an yep. entire podcast about that, I feel like. <laughs> yep. Yeah, no, true. I mean, the safety is so important, and I'm sure as you travel, you're going to go through places as much as you try to avoid that are a little sketchy than others, so you want to feel comfortable with your, your bike. So, Corey, you brought up something about, you know, having, you know, uncles and grandpas and stuff, and it's, it's kind of funny you say that because – Re- s- slight sidestep, but you know w- what you're talking about there. Like I, I recently renovated, you know, a room in my house, and you know, I grew up the son of a carpenter and the grandson of a carpenter, so I did probably ninety percent of the work. My house ha- myself when I took a half bath, turned into a full bath, but then you know I had to put a cutout panel so I can get to the uh, get get to the controls or whatever you want to call it or the shower from the other bathroom and I, I called my dad remember my dad called me one day he's like what are you doing I was like I'm on my way to Lowe's I gotta get some trim work so I can put this panel in oh no 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 I, I got the trim don't don't bother buying and I've got it over here at the shop he shows up with the entire like panel built with trim and air. all I had to do was put two screws in it so yeah, I mean, some of my jobs look better than, you know, what I can actually do, too, because, you know, you, you, you might have some skilled uh, family members that are, are willing to pitch in, where if you got to do that on your own, you know, I probably would have had 80% scrap and a hell of a lot more time invested, but when they've got that stuff sitting around and they've done it a million times before, they do it quickly and they do it cheaply, so. Exactly, and there's a lot of stories like that. There's a lot of people I've met who have a similar thing. And I think anybody though, who did 90% of the work in their van, they would all say the same thing, which is there isn't a single perpendicular or straight piece in that van. And that's the same can be said to mind. It looks pretty good until you start taking a tape measure to things. And you realize that no matter how hard I tried, things were cut slightly different. Uh, <laughs> angles are not 90 degree angles, but it works. So you mentioned van 2.0. Uh, obviously you're, I don't want to say you're learning from your mistakes, but, but you are, or you're just learning that, Hey, these are things that I, w- I want to make changes to, you know, on, on the, on the next build essentially. So w- what are some of those things you're looking at? Like now that you've lived in it for that period of time, you're like, I wish I would have done this. I'm definitely going to upgrade this. What are, what are, you know, your top two or three that kind of stand out to you that you want to make those changes? Yeah. So the back half of my van was essentially the garage. And when I had time to put everything in a nice organized fashion, it looked great. But that's not how life works. And, you know, it'll start raining on you when you're at the riding area and you need to load up or you're just in a hurry because you're on a call with your boss and he wants you to do something. But at the same time, you plan to be at a riding area five hours from where you're currently parked. So things get thrown in and it just became a mess. So I'm building the whole back half of it, my garage part. And I'm including a spot to have an actual refrigerator. I did this with just a cooler. And the cooler worked, but it has its downsides. Um, To to say that, you know, food only lasts for three or four days. And then at that point, even though it's cold enough, it's all water inside the cooler. And your food becomes soggy. And you're in the middle of the desert in Utah. And you hadn't planned to leave your riding area yet because you, you know, you thought you had enough food, but now you don't have any food because it's all soggy. Uh, so you live off of protein uh, powder from Rhino Power, by the way. 
There you go. Uh, get that plug in there. Plugs. Yeah. Yeah. Great stuff. Honestly, their hydration fuel. Fantastic. Um, with that said, you know, you live off protein powder and you live off of, uh, pop tarts. I, I did that for two days and then I finally had my fill. I had ridden everything I wanted to in the area. So I said, okay, I'm going to go get a hotel room tonight. Yeah, you know, when you and I talked, that was one thing I found interesting, and, and I'm sure it happens way more than we think it does. Like, you're living in a van most of the time, but you were also staying in hotels from time to time. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, well, it's it's balance, right? Um, and as glamorous as it seems on Instagram, Right. You always see pictures. <laughs> you always see pictures of these vans parked over some scenic overlook. Right. With a cute girl in a bikini, you know, standing over a, a cliff in California. That's not even remotely was not my experience ever. I don't even own a bikini. So <laughs> <laughs> the. The takeaway there is we're spoiled in our day-to-day life now, even if things are hard, you know, having a roof over your head, having air conditioning, having all these nice creature comforts. It's, it's a lot to just take yourself away from. And I mean, even when I deployed, I was in the air force, you know, so I was just like one star below a hotel. (laughs) Um, Any of my army guys or uh, Marine guys out there, you know, I love you, but uh, definitely we had the better bases. I'm not afraid to say it. Uh, <laughs> but you know, yeah, I guess I wanted to balance out and you get tired of living off of, you know, camp cook, camp cooked food, or you get tired of taking a shower out of a shower bag, you know, in the middle of the desert. Um, you get tired of not having air conditioning and always having to swat at bugs, things like that. So I would break it up. I would do about every five days. I would get myself a hotel and occasionally I would wake up and say, I'm not ready to go yet. And I'd stay another night. Um, you know, and I worked really hard to get myself in a financial position where that was was possible. I know a lot of people don't do that. And in fact, a lot of people, um, they put all of their savings in the van and they take off and they have this glamorous idea of being this gypsy going around the United States And they stay at, you know, they boondock. They stay at these free places to stay out west. And I've been to a lot of them. And while they're scenic, there's no restroom facility there. There's there's nothing. And I've parked there and and nobody comes out of their camper or their van. It's just a bunch of strangers just keeping to themselves like hermits inside their vans. And I didn't enjoy that. I feel like you miss out on that that experience of talking to people. And I think that's why we all love motorcycles, right? We talked about it earlier. You go to a racetrack and it's, it's why Corey and I met. It's a freak chance, but we started talking. You, you go to a motorcycle, you, you know, event, the, the events that Mario has, and you, you turn strangers into friends. And, and I feel like if you're traveling across the country, that's, that's some of what you want to have. You want to hear different stories. Where are they coming from? You know, that's interesting to me. Yeah. And what was crazy is probably the first two months of my trip, everywhere I went, occasionally I would see another rider or two. I was usually at like OHB areas because you could stay there for free Um, and they had a bathroom. So it was a win-win and, you know, I'd I'd get done work for the day and I'd go hit the trails on my bike and I'd come back and there'd still be nobody there. And, you know, that desolation, it got to me a few times. Like I was out at, um, shoot they shoot a lot of freestyle videos there um swing arm city in utah okay you know awesome place again keeping the theme of like childhood me has always wanted to go ride at that place after i I would see videos like nitro circus you know um off the pipe videos like that and while i don't jump at all it was fun to ride around but at night so dark and nobody's there And I was just on the off season, I guess, but I'm all by myself and it, it starts to eat at you after a while for sure. So it was nice to go into the hotel and, and actually just have people there to talk to. I, I didn't meet other riders until I got out 
to on the later part of my trip to Oregon and then Idaho. I was at Gold Creek Lodge and that was probably the highlight of my entire, you know, five months in the van was Gold Creek Lodge because I met other riders. I got to actually talk and, and meet. I have lifelong friends now from just five days out there. And yeah, it's incredible. Yeah, it's awesome. So I know we touched a lot on the van life stuff and I think we're going to hit a commercial break here. And then when we come back, talk more in depth about the riding aspect, where you went, how long you went and really dive into the, the two wheel aspect of it. And a lot of our listeners are all around travel, whether it's motorcycle or, or um, dirt bikes, they're all about those new experiences and where they want to go next. So we'll uh, get back to that right after the commercial break. Hey guys, Mario here. If you'd like to help support the Two Wheeled Rider podcast, head on over to patreon.com forward slash Two Wheeled Rider. On there, you'll find a few different options. For as low as $2 a month, you can be a contributor. And for as high as $10 a month, you can be an executive producer. We also have production crew in between. Be sure to check out what you get at each different level. But I think the coolest one is probably the executive producer level for $10 a month, where you will be granted early entry into any Two Wheeled Rider riding event. And if you follow those events in the past, you know they sell out in minutes. Actually, the last one in seconds. So it's pretty much the only way to guarantee that you're going to get a spot. Don't want to mess with Patreon? Head on over to 2wrpodcast.com and click on the membership tab. On there, you'll find all the same options we have on Patreon, plus a one-time contributor option should you not want to subscribe, or maybe you'd like to be the whiskey sponsor. I'll let you read up about that over there. In addition to all of those options, at different tiers, we'll be giving away different prize packs. When we hit $100, we gave away a $100 Rocky Mountain ATV gift card. When we hit $250, it'll be something else, and so on and so on. But if you don't want to support us monetarily, that's okay too. We just hope you enjoy listening to the podcast and maybe share it with a friend. All right. We are back from that commercial. Uh, Corey, you, you mentioned you were, unless I misheard you, you were gone for five months in the van, um, and you can correct me here in a second if I'm wrong. What, what was one of your favorite places to, I, I don't care if it's ride, hang out, see? What, what's something that stands out to you on that trip? 100% it was Oregon. Oregon surpassed my expectations in every way. Um, I, I spent most of my time out there in the Tillamook State Forest outside of Portland. And f there was mountaintops out there that at the top of it, I could see the Pacific Ocean. I could see Mount Hood and I could see Mount St. Helens from the same peak. And uh, that's when I actually first met some other riders and got to like, you know, drink by the campfire at night with them and just get to know somebody from literally the other side of the United States. And, uh, yeah, the, just the vibe there was amazing and I can't wait to go back. Yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. So you mentioned about obviously riding your dirt bike and getting around the campfire and, and something that I always admire because I'm always fortunate to ride with, with Mario on the, 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 uh, ADV stuff. And, and even with dirt bikes, I don't expand too much by myself. And Mario heads all the way to Alaska. He's got the spot tracker, and it worries me, especially out West, riding alone it is a whole different animal in itself. And I'm sure it's awesome when you run into people, but maybe talk about how you take your dirt bike to remote locations and then decide to take your dirt bike out there, trusting the mechanical of it to, to get you back and also navigating an area you've never been. Yeah, so I want to preface this with saying that it's never a smart idea to go riding by yourself in a remote area. I wouldn't do it if I had a choice. And what I mean by that is, you know, this was an opportunity, a once in a lifetime kind of opportunity. I wasn't sure how long things were gonna hold out for my job. It's already pulled me back into the DC area uh, for the time being. And I was, I wanted to make the most of it. And I, as a kid, I'd always, you know, seen all these riding areas that I wanted to go ride at. And it was just so different from the East Coast. You know, the Arizona desert is as far away from West Virginia <laughs> as you can get in terms of riding. And I wanted to enjoy that and experience that. 
So I, I assumed a lot of risk up front just to do that. With that in mind, you know, I've been writing now for 20 years. And while I'm by no means an expert or whoever claimed to be, I know how to manage my risk while I'm out. And I, I spend a lot of time hiking and outside as well. And I understand, you know, how to read maps and also understand like, yeah, that doesn't look like it's that far away, but it could be five or six trail miles and you have to go back. Oh, and the sun, you know, sets at this time and it gets all those factors to kind of consider along with fuel miles, along with your mechanical thing. Like I was always listening to my bike and trying to make sure that, you know, if I heard anything that sounded remotely funny, just turn around and head back now, check it out at camp. And if it's good, we'll head back out after lunch. It, it was a lot. And there was several times where I got off and would walk the bike through sections because you would get on a trail they would say it's a double diamond. It's supposed to be the hardest it could be. And you get on and be like, oh, this is easy. Well, you get five miles down the trail and then there's like a sheer cliff on one side and it's an off camber over top of like some kind of like boulder trowels hop. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> here's well, the double diamond. Right. There's the double diamond. And the chances. So that's that's one of those things when I would get to obstacles like that. And. I didn't have anybody to talk it through. So on my helmet cam video, you just have me talking to myself. And I'm like, man, if I could probably get it over this, but if I mess up and I high side, I'm high siding over a cliff. And I'm not walking out of here like that. And when's the next time somebody's going to be coming through this area? I'm 20 miles from my camp in the middle of Arizona. So I would get off and I would walk it over. No shame, you know, and it's just that that risk management. And I would only ride at 50, 60 percent my speed. Occasionally, I would see something like a good, nice single track piece that I would just have to rip. And by the way, guys, you know, my when I say I have to rip it, it does not look like a double way racker <laughs> or anything cool. There might have been a rooster tail. Probably not. Yeah, but after your you're riding cautiously and you, like you said, risk manage and go, Hey, here's a section I can actually go have fun for you. It's like, yeah, I'm flowing now. I'm going fast because I just had to crawl my way through the last section to be safe. Yeah, no. And that's because it, like it still wasn't race pace, you know? Um, I was just always checking myself and making sure that I wasn't making a mistake that was going to end me up on, the next show of like, I shouldn't be alive on discovery channel, you know? So Corey of all the places, and it just doesn't have to be riding just that you visited. Is there anything that kind of stands out to you where you're like, yeah, I'll avoid that place next time. I don't want to go back there again. <sighs> Man, Wyoming. So obviously the Eastern part of Wyoming where it's just flat. And I think as my dad put it one day, we should just give that back to the Indians. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You know, so every, when people visit Wyoming, um, they go to the Grand Tetons, right? Yep. Or Tetons. And that's it. They hit Yellowstone, the Grand Tetons. That's the only good parts of Wyoming. (laughs) Right. Well, the rest of the state, while there's some parts that are beautiful, the wind just blows like you wouldn't believe. And I'm in a high top van. <laughs> and while there's no chance of it tipping over, it's hard to keep on the road. I don't have the weight of an 18 wheeler. So when you see them get blown sideways, I'm like a kite in a hurricane, man. <laughs> yeah. So I remember between- riding through there uh, on the bike one year and I swear to God for like 200 miles, I just leaned to the right because the wind was coming from the south. And then I eventually, you know, it's kind of a grid-style road system out there. And then mm-hmm. I'd head north, and I'd get this nice tailwind for, like, 20 miles. And then I'd have to head east again. I was like, oh, my God, this is awful. Yeah, I would dread having to turn back into the wind out of those tailwinds. And between that, and it, got, it was really cold. So I built my van light and utilitarian. And I was always of the mindset, if I'm someplace that's too cold for me to be camping, I'm just going to pack up and drive somewhere that's warmer. 
<laughs> you know, uh, I'll okay. get a hotel for the night, but I'm going to change my plans and I'm going to go back to Arizona if there's a cold front coming across, you know, the West and uh, Wyoming the entire time. I didn't ride anywhere out there. I was just passing through on my way to the uh, the Pacific West. And it was just windy and like 25 degrees at night, even though it was April, May. I forget what, what time frame it was, but I mean, it it wasn't winter, but it's still in the point. I mean, there was the, the mountains still had snow, right? You know, it's a different world out there, but it's still, I did not enjoy it at all. I'd like to go back and give it another shot. There's a lot more planning, I feel like, because it's it's not even a, you could travel 75 miles, and if you're going up in elevation, the, way, the weather changes drastically. Oh, yeah, absolutely, man. I mean, Arizona is a great uh, case of that. You know, you get down in the valley, it's 90 degrees, but at the same time, overnight, the mountains around there got snow. I was in Tucson, and we got some rain in the desert, but up, up top, there was snow. And if you headed towards Flagstaff, you get on that plateau there, and there's snow up there as well. Yeah, it's crazy. So I got another question around the two track. I know we talked about Oregon, but obviously passion around single track. What other areas were you just mesmerized about riding your dirt bike? So I will say this, what I rode up at Idaho around the Gold Creek Lodge area. I mean, I had a lot of fun because of the lodge, but the hype isn't quite what I was expecting it to be. I mean, you hear amazing things about the place and the single track up there. I guess think people who ride there and like, this is amazing single track. They haven't ridden good tr- single track yet. <laughs> well, you come from West Virginia. So I agree. yeah, man, I, I, I spent, I spent my childhood, you know, cutting my teeth at the Boyer farm. Hey, um, I, so in terms of best single track that I rode, I had some really good stuff out in Arizona. Oregon had some amazing single track. Oregon had had stuff where you're riding between these these huge trees, looking like something out of like ET, you know, <laughs> like, and you're just bobbing weaving between the trees, kind of ATV wide, and then suddenly it goes into a clear cut area, and you realize that you're on a super steep hill, and it's a very narrow single track, and it's whooped out a bit, so you're jumping it. And you're jumping in. If you get the wrong kick going off the, you know, face of the jump, you're going towards one of those cliffs and you have to like your, your butt puckers a little bit, you know, and you hit the brakes and you go, you know, I'm by myself and I'm, I'm three mountains over from the campsite. Maybe I should back this down, but then you pop around the corner and it's another just beautiful area. And then you just got to rip, man. So I got to say again, Oregon takes the cake, but I kept trying to get up into like the higher elevations in the Rockies while I was there and the snow just wasn't cooperating. Um, you know, the riding areas were open, but there was just a lot of frozen snow on the ground and kind of, you know, it just wasn't good riding. So I would just move on and I want to get back out there. Cause I think that's probably where the best single track out West would be is probably up there in the Rockies. Yeah. I talked to a lot of guys when we were out there in August, they were on, you know, 701s, 990s, bikes like that. Cause they, they weren't just riding off road. They're riding the town, that sort of thing. And everybody out there was having a blast. Colorado is kind of tough to beat. So, uh, any story that stands out for you? Like, you know, somebody asked you, Hey, is there, is there something that stands out on this trip? Anything you want to share with the listeners from that standpoint? So I do have something good. Um, it's not a funny story though. It, it's fun. definitely, it gets, it gets serious. Um, so for you PG 13 listeners at home, you know, maybe, uh, go get something to drink. Uh, I, I get the, when I first started, I was in Arizona and I was having a hard time trying to find a place to camp. Uh, all the snowbirds were there and I need, when I camp, I needed to find a place where I had cell service so I could work which is not a need that a lot of people have when they do these things. Uh, and after a week, I found myself at the Lost Dutchman State Park outside of Phoenix, Arizona. And at the time, I was still very just nervous about being completely by myself in the van, going riding. You know, I wanted to go hike, but I'm hiking alone in Cougar Country. 
you know, and as an East Coast guy, the idea of cougars being out there and then when you get up north, grizzlies, like it, it's it's different. Um, they're not black bears. <laughs> so I, I had a lot of fear. Um, I'm not ashamed to say that. And I decided to go for a hike one afternoon after I finished work at Lost Dutch State Park. And it ends up, turns out it's probably one of the places in Arizona that I would say next to the Grand Canyon probably has the most rescues um, in the state of Arizona. I learned this after the fact. So you're kind of going up this gulch with sheer cliffs on both sides. And it doesn't look that bad from the approach, but as you get into it, there's these nonstop boulders that you have to climb over that are as tall as a man. And it gets very rugged, and I'm by myself because I started the hike not in the morning when everybody else did, but in the afternoon because of my work. And I'm about halfway up, and I'm literally trying to catch my breath, and I'm thinking about just turning around, saying the view from the top is not going to be worth it. I don't want to do this. I'm scared for whatever reason. And as I'm staring up, I hear somebody say, oh, shit. And I see a body fall off of a cliff. At least what looked like a body. (laughs) And a huge thud happens and it echoes down the canyon. And I'm sitting there. I'm trying to process what I just said. I'm like, maybe it was something else. And I'm looking at the top of the cliff. It's about a 400 foot drop. And I don't see anybody. I don't hear anybody screaming. I don't hear kids playing, you know, nothing. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure that was somebody that I just saw fall off a cliff. I'm by myself. I had a little bit of cell reception. So I called the, the Phoenix, um, you know, 911 and asked for search and rescue. And the lady basically says, well, you know, I'm sorry. I don't want to send anybody until can you get eyes on the body? Can you confirm for me? Oh, geez. <laughs> what you saw. I told you this is it, it's it's a deep story. Um but I promise it has a has a point besides shock. I without a moment's hesitation, I start to climb up the rest of this mountain. You know, all that fear that I had before, that hesitation about being by myself, you know, like I didn't care. My only thought was there's somebody that could be hurt. And I'm the only one who saw what happened. And I get up to where I saw the body land. And this is a, it was probably took me a good 15, 20 minutes of just huffing to get up there. And I see an impact, but to the right and to the left, it like the, where they landed was on a, on a spine. And to the right and the left was like, almost like a waterfall, like shoot, super steep. And I climbed out there. I couldn't see anything. So I thought, well, what are the chances that person was by themselves? Nobody, I hear nobody up here yelling, nothing going on. It was kids playing. They threw something off. I'm, I didn't see it. So I finished the climb. I get up the top of the mountain. And as I'm on the top of it, I hear the echo of a chopper. And I immediately recognize it as a search and rescue chopper with the man hanging out the side. And I'm like, oh, shit. This is real. And I'm still the only one up on the mountain at this time. And I start scrambling back down to get to the spine where I saw the body hit. And I wave the, the, the chopper over because they're looking like way down the valley. They thought they fell off of like one of the higher cliffs. And this one was a different one that's kind of off the main trail. And the copper comes over and they search and they, they try to find it and nothing comes up. They come back three different times because they had to refuel. And after the third time they located the body and it was a recovery. It was not a rescue. And I get down on the bottom and I, I debrief with the, the sheriffs and I, I go back to my van. And as I'm back to my van, I see them, see the body in the stretcher coming off the mountain on the helicopter. And I, I want to talk about, you know, I have this belief that everything happens for a reason. And 
I just happened to be at the right place at the right time. Nobody else was on that mountain besides this man. He was all by himself. And I just happened to be looking up thinking, do I want to continue to climb this? Had I not, I probably would have not. I would have heard it, but I would not have seen where he fell. So I do believe that I was put there at the right place in the right time so that man could get home to his family that night. But for the rest of the night, I grappled with like, holy cow, this guy was by himself in this remote area, just like I am. He accidentally slipped. He got too close to the cliff and he fell. I heard his last words. That could be me. That could be me tomorrow. And if nobody's up there with me, I mean, if I wasn't there, they wouldn't have found that body for months. It's the, the terrain was so rugged and the vegetation was extremely thick up there. Uh, I don't know if they would have ever found him. So Corey, how early on was this in your trip that this happened? This was week two. Wow. Uh, and you just yeah. had to keep going on. Yeah. Because what it, like I said, it was, it was a night of whiskey. It was a night of thinking, yeah. um, I and a lot of there. phone calls to some, some close friends. And, you know, it, it really, it made me realize how dangerous it was of what I was doing. It's not what you see on Instagram. Right. And I, I wasn't naive to this, but seeing it firsthand, it hits you differently. But the other thing I realized was the moment that I had an action, I went from hesitating to being scared to going, I can get up there. In fact, you know, yes, it's, it's super steep and it's a gnarly climb. And it's a, a cliff that I got to go out on, but I'm going to get up there and I'm going to, and I'm going to use the skills that I've learned over the years. I'm going to get up there and I'm going to see if I can't help this person. And I realized that I was capable of doing this. And then I realized that I was capable of, you know, making the van thing work and going riding and doing it safely and, you know, just camping and living, I guess you could say off the grid, but, you know, living out in the woods. It was it was a huge moment, um, and it, it's weird that it happened because the first week I, I had shown up to Arizona, and I couldn't find a camping spot, so I cashed in on my, my hotel reverse points, and I stayed at this nice Cush resort in Tucson for a week. And towards the end of the week, I'm like, oh, man, this, if I keep this up, if I can't find a camping spot that has you know, a cell signal, I'm, I'm not going to be able to afford to do this for another two or three weeks. I'm going to have to turn around and go home. I'm going to fail. My yeah. dad's be like, I told you so. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think you succeeded just there with helping out. I think that's such a powerful story on that, that balance from taking it from the writing aspect and taking those same lessons you learned into that. And I think those are some great lessons. Is there any other lessons that you learned through this travel um, besides kind of that safety aspect and looking out for others? Um, that you'd incorporate into the, the kind of that van life travel. Plan, plan, and plan some more, but don't stop your trip because you haven't arrived to a full plan yet. I, I don't know how else to phrase that. I mean, I've always I, put it as good is better than or, or or done is better than perfect. Like, have a plan, go do it. But if you're going to sit around and wait for it to be perfect, well, that day's never going to happen. And then time's going to pass you by. So, Right. I mean, there's many times I was trying to find a campsite. And when I was debating about what campsites I wanted to go to in the area, they would all sell out. <laughs> and I was like, well, so there goes that plan. I got to go to another area. You know, I got to go camp at a Walmart parking lot tonight because I don't have a place to stay. And I, I, I can't afford a hotel this week. Um. So that was the thing. I, I was moving at a fast pace because I wasn't sure how long this was going to last. And in the future, and there's going to be a future, um, you know, next year, I'm already planning trips. Well, let, let's get into that. What's going on for 2022? What are you, what are you, what are you thinking? All right. Well, hey, so uh, for your more adventurous guys, everybody knows tomorrow is the sign up for Red Bull Romaniacs. And I am, uh, I'm, I'm finally going to sign up and do it again. It's, you know, living the life that little kid Corey wanted to live. Right. I, I watched that Nitro Circus. Um, I think it was like three. 
they went out to Romaniacs, and I was just in awe, and I've always wanted to do it. So Romaniacs is happening. I'm going to sign up tomorrow morning. Do you, do you know Lee Hickok? <laughs> you know, it's funny you say that. My dad asked me about him last night because uh, apparently he just did it this year, right? Well, it's I think it's a second year, so if you don't have his contact, I'll hook you up. You got to talk to him because, I mean, he's, you know, someone I raced enduros with, a beast of a guy, and I think it, it was a second year completing it. Um, so I think that's a valuable uh, uh, event that some experience from, from prior people <laughs> will definitely help. So definitely uh, uh, we'll, we'll talk after. Yeah, man. Um, so there's Romaniacs is a big one, but next year, you know, I'm going to spend at least a month down in Florida. Uh, and then I want to head back out west, um, spend some more time in Texas and Arizona and work my way into California. I've been to California, but I've, I did not get a chance to hit it in the van and I didn't get a chance to ride. And there's places like Glamis out there that I want to hit. I want I would love to get down to Baja as well and do some riding. So I'm going to try to work that in. And then hopefully in July, after Romaniacs, I'm going to stay out in Europe for a couple more months. And try the remote work thing out there while also riding some dirt bikes, motorcycles, Vespas, whatever I can get my hands on that have, has two wheels. Two wheels and, and a motor. Yeah, yeah, motor. That's all I need. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're going to do that. And that's that's the plan. So the van's still very much a thing. I, I want to say that the biggest thing that I, I really took out of the whole five months in a van thing was I missed having a house. It there would be so many nights I would be driving, you know, nine, 10 hours to my next des- destination and I'm tired and the van smells because my riding gear smells, my boots are, you know, are their own science experiment. And, <laughs> uh, I'm driving past these houses and their, their living rooms are like lighting up because they're watching Netflix on the couch. Right. In a nice air conditioned house probably with a nice glass of whiskey and they're all comfy and cozy and they had a hot shower. And I'm like, man, I had that. <laughs> uh, and I don't have to not have it. So that's, that's my thing is it's finding a place that supports the van's lifestyle because it gives me sufficient funds to go out for a month at a time, but have a home to go back to when I want to have a go back to home. I think it's pretty cool. You figured out what it is you like to do. I, I'm with you. I, I couldn't, I couldn't give up a house full time, but you know, being out on the road for extended periods of time is a lot of fun. I personally, I don't want to live on the road forever though, or or indefinitely. So Brian, is there anything else you want to cover tonight? No, I just, uh, you know, glad to get Corey on here. I think, uh, lived vicariously through his adventures in the van and being able to ride in different locations. And I think we all dream of riding somewhere different. You know, I, talk to plenty of people and they wish they could ride where I ride and I wish they I could ride where they rode so I think it's it's neat being able to jump in in there and uh experience a whole new Brian, situation Brian you got a 1290 you can go ride the thing wherever you want you just chosen not to leave like the tri-state area that's not ha- that's not anybody else's y- fault but your y- own you, you you both received the picture that I sent you just to get down to the again studio to record we know who calls that Brian I don't know about that picture but every time I turn around, you're you're barbecuing, and I think if you spend as much time barbecuing as you did riding, you you can make it happen. <laughs> yeah, that's because my kids like barbecue. Hey, yeah. I'm a, a few years away from them being able to either ride on the back or, or ride on their own bike, and uh, or get jobs try. and move out of the house. <laughs> yeah, that too. Or move into if they don't, they'll right. end up in a van <laughs> down by the river. Yeah, exactly. Hey, I'd be okay with that. And I live. In a van down by the river. Listen, dude, you know, Case could pull that impression off. He he looks like a small little version of Chris Farley most of the time when I see him. So <laughs> yeah. All right, Corey, let's little jacket. <laughs> we need him the plaid jacket. Hey, Halloween's coming up. Hey, I like your ideas. That, that'd be a <laughs> good one, man. That'd be, that'd be you could you could dress uh cold up as uh David Spade in that skit. He's he's skinny with blonde hair just like Spade was back uh, then. So I'm loving this. Oh man. All right, Corey, listen, man, Halloween we, ideas. we, uh, we appreciate having you on. I'm going to link your, uh, your Instagram down in the show notes. So if people want to check out some photos, you know, kind of follow along with what you did and what you're going to do. 
Um, you know, I think that'd be cool. So, um, listen, I hope you guys enjoyed listening to tonight's or whenever we air it, but we're recording it tonight podcast. Um, if you got any questions, you know, we're going to link Corey below. You can hit him up directly. If you got questions for me and Brian, we always have our email address down there. We do have a Facebook forum, uh, for podcast questions. Maybe you have a suggestion of a guest you'd like to have on. We're more than welcome to reach out to anyone. We've got quite a few good guests lined up coming up here. Um, and uh, you can always head over to uh, 2WR Podcast, stream them there, or on your favorite co- podcast platform. So once again, uh, thank you for joining the Two Wheel Rider Podcast. I'm your host, Mario Orsini, joined by Brian Boyer. We'll talk to you guys again soon.